Good evening. My name is Maine Castillo. I'm Town Hall's program manager. On behalf of the rest of the staff at Town Hall and our partners at Elliott Bay Books, it's my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's live stream presentation with author and cross country coach Johanna Garden and professional climber Mark Gunlogson. As we get underway, I would like to acknowledge that our institution stands on the unceded traditional territory of the Coast Salish people, particularly the Duwamish. We thank them for our continued use of the natural resources of their ancestral homeland. Thank you all for tuning in. Town Hall is proud to be a community-focused organization, a place where we can share and sustain ideas and creativity, even if we can't gather in person. I'd like to thank Johanna and Mark for appearing tonight to help make this possible. Town Hall will be taking a short break this winter, but if you're looking for us, we are always online. You can check out many of our past talks available in video or podcast form on our digital media library at townhallseattle.org. Town Hall and the nonprofit community at large has been put under significant strain due to the ever-changing landscape. We hope you'll consider extending your generosity to help support us during this difficult time by making a donation and becoming a member. Click on the donate button at the bottom of your screen at any time. Our partner booksellers have been hit by the negative effects of the COVID outbreak as well and can use your support. We encourage you to support local independent bookstores by purchasing a copy of the book being presented tonight. Use the link on this live stream page to purchase through Elliott Bay Books. For viewers who want to watch this broadcast with closed captioning, we recommend viewing the stream via our YouTube page linked here in the chat. To enable real-time closed captioning, click the CC button in the bottom right corner of the video player. The video will be available for rewatching immediately following tonight's broadcast. Tonight's presentation will be about an hour, including Q&A. Questions will be selected from those submitted in the Ask a Question field at the bottom center of your screen. We will also take questions from those submitted in the YouTube chat. We can't guarantee that we will be able to address every question, but we'll try to get to as many as possible. Please keep your questions concise and in the form of a question. Town Hall's work is made possible through your support and the support of our sponsors. Our Arts and Culture series is supported by For Culture, Arts Fund, Seattle Office of Arts and Culture, and Wincoat Foundation Northwest. Finally, Town Hall is a member-supported organization, so I'd like to thank all of our members watching tonight. And now for tonight's program, Christine Boscoff was at the top of her career when she and her partner died in an avalanche in 2006. Author Johanna Garten joins us to share why she was drawn to telling Boscoff's story. Johanna Garten is a mother, author, and cross-country coach. As an AmeriCorps VISTA member in Chicago, Garten worked on behalf of refugee survivors of torture at the Heartland Alliance. She has served on the Colorado Governor's Commission on Community Service and taught advocacy and legal issues for nonprofits at Regis University. Several years of living and working in Asia inspired her to write her first book, Awakening East, Moving Our Adopted Children Back to China which was released in 2015. Mark Gunlogson's climbing career spans more than 40 years across the globe, more than 30 of which include working in the guiding industry. Also included in this time is 26 years at Mountain Madness, where he has worked alongside Scott Fisher and 10 years with Christine Boscoff. Johanna's book, Edge of the Map, The Mountain Life of Christine Boscoff is the subject of this evening's talk. Please join me in welcoming Mark Gunlogson and Johanna Garten. Megan, thank you so much for that amazing introduction. I'm so excited to be here tonight. I am really honored to be asked to speak with you. Uh, Town Hall is such a fixture in the Seattle community and beyond. So very grateful to be here and i know i speak for mark as well so we are going to just dive right in josh that very first slide i think is the cover of the book i have got about a 25 minute presentation uh or so give or take and it talks i'll talk a little bit about my journey to right edge of the map and then hopefully answer your questions so as i'm talking please feel free to kind of pop those in the bottom and we will keep track of those and get to those at the end so Again, this is Edge of the Map, my second book. Uh, my first book is Awakening East, and there's an image of that as well. I am a writer based in Denver. Edge is my second book, as I said. My first book was published in 2015, and it was about the adoption of my two children from China and our subsequent move back to China when the kids were about four and nine, I believe, and we had a very wacky year. So I have been working on books for about six or seven years now. 
Prior to that, I had a number of different careers. I'm trained as a journalist and a lawyer. I've worked in nonprofits for many years. I taught here in Denver at Regis University in the Master of Nonprofit Management program. And now I'm writing. So we've got a great image of Everest to sort of kick off our presentation. And this is an image that many of you may be familiar with. It was taken last year in May 2019. And it was taken by Nims Persia, who is a Nepalese mountaineer, as he was attempting to summit Mount Everest. And it shows just this kind of catastrophic queue of climbers on the way to the summit. And I'm including it here to illustrate where my journey with EDGE started. And it was because, like so many of you, I'm interested in mountain stories, fascinated by them, really. So I am not a climber nor a mountaineer. But for my entire life, I have been drawn to stories that take place in the mountains. I have wanted to understand the mentality of climbers, the risks and the drama that are part of the sport, the losses, the grief, the exhilarating highs, all of it has just really been very fascinating to me. So after the publication of my first book, I began looking for a second project. And I had a couple of projects in mind. One was sort of a fluffy piece of, I guess what you would call chick lit. The second piece was a deep dive into China's one child policy, which was really interesting to me. And then there was a story that my mother, also a writer, had been working on for about 10 years. And that was the story of Christine Boscoff. So she'd been working on the book for about 10 years and slowly began to realize that she wouldn't be able to finish the book because of the advancement of Parkinson's disease, which she'd been living with for a few years at that point. And so at that point, I offered to help her finish the book. So I'll go back to this at the end. Some of you may already know this story, uh, but I'll share with you at the end, if, if you don't, how she got involved with Chris's story. But let me just tell you how I picked which one to, to focus on. So I took all three of these projects to my writing group, which is this group of amazing women here in Denver who write and we share our writing every, every month. And I sort of explained all three projects. And as soon as I kind of dived into the story of Chris Boscoff, they all said, this is the story. You have got to write the story. It's so compelling and you don't really have a choice. It's The choice is clear. So off I went, uh, not really having a clue how deep I was going to dive into the story. And I learned very quickly that Chris's story was just incredibly compelling. I had learned bits and pieces of her story over the years as my mom had worked on it. Chris's sort of headline from her professional career was that she was the only American woman to have summited six of the world's 8,000 meter peaks. And that was a record she set in the year 2000. And it actually is a record that still stands today, 20 years later, which is quite remarkable. She had gone from a successful career as an aerospace engineer into the sport of mountaineering in her mid 20s. She and her husband, Keith Boscoff, who was 17 ish years older than her, had bought Seattle adventure travel company, Mountain Madness, from the estate of Scott Fisher, a guide who had died on Everest in 1996. And I think a lot of you will remember that tragedy through the lens of John Krakauer's book, Into Thin Air. But before we get to that, I did wanna mention um, that I've talked a lot about Everest in this picture with, that Nims Persia took about this kind of the what's happened on Everest and what it looks like now compared to 30 years ago. Because uh, I wanted to get sort of a mountaineer's perspective on how that has changed. And I've talked a lot about this with Mark. So I thought maybe I'd bring him in here at this point to kind of say a few words about that and maybe even about this picture in particular. Sure. Yeah. Well, um, it's great to be here. And, and I think uh, um, having you know been with uh, Mount Manor for so long, I'm really happy to be able to tell the story. And I think um, this picture, um, you know, it, it's sort of widely seen and uh, you know it's out there in social media and i think uh it, it's kind of shows where things have gone with mountain, the mountain and i think you know scott first guided uh the mount, first mount mountain's trip on everest in 96 there were certainly a lot of people um but uh you know seeing sort of progress with the uh commercial guiding business uh, things just got more and more crowded and the same for chris i mean she was there uh, I think maybe six, six, seven years after Scott, and, and you know the crowds and the numbers are increasing, and so it, it really kind of um, the guiding and just the popularity of climbing 
increased and you know here, here you are and so i think there's a lot of a lot of stories can be told about how crowded the mountain is and it certainly is this one you know it's it's not i'm not altogether fair because it's not like this every summer day when people go um to reach the top this is you know they're one of the things where people got backed up and they're all kind of waiting to go to the summit uh and so it kind of turned into this big mess um but you know the the sad thing and and i think um you know it's maybe irreversible you know the mountain's never going to be like it was a hundred years ago uh when people first started poking around at its base to see if it was climbable and so um you know that's kind of a bummer um but you know so the good news though um you know and this is something that chris really uh eventually grabbed onto was there, there's so many places out there uh, outside of Everest and the popular peaks that people climb. And th that's kind of where, you know, the title of the book came, The Edge of the Map. Chris started to go to these sort of uncharted areas where people hadn't climbed and they could do first ascents. And it kind of took her back maybe more to the uh, spirit of climbing. And, and it, it uh, was an altogether different experience than what you see here. And I think uh, the title of the book is great too, because uh, as, as Joanna, uh, sort of tells a story you'll see it it's sort of a great metaphor for other sort of barriers and and boundaries uh chris pushed and so yeah it's 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 been an interesting story and i'll let uh let you go from there joanna uh, yeah thanks mark yes i do end up loving the title i think it really captures a lot of different pieces of who she was and it is this really wonderful metaphor so Yes, and I think we've got that picture of Into Thin Air, which we can show now, Josh. And I know most of you, many of you, I would think, uh, tuning in tonight have read it or at least have heard about it. So the next one is a great picture of Chris that I don't think is in the book, but I love. She had an absolutely breathtaking rise in the sport. And given that she was a woman, her accomplishments were even more notable as obviously it's a sport that's dominated by men. It was and still is. She never saw her gender as what defined her. And so to me, that is really what made her story so captivating and so inspiring. It was about who she was and how she approached this passion with so much humility that really made, uh, made me wanna tell her story and made my mother interested in telling her story as well. So there are a lot of twists and turns in the book and in the narrative. But one thing that is not a spoiler is that in 2006, Chris perished in an avalanche in Western Sichuan province in China with her climbing partner and her boyfriend, uh, Charlie Fowler. And this next image is a picture of Chris and Charlie. This is the last picture taken of them. They had gone to explore a remote part of Sichuan province. And when they literally didn't return on their flight home, a search and rescue operation was launched. Now at that time, Charlie and Chris were living in, out here in Colorado, in Norwood, Colorado, just outside Telluride. The search involved kind of a coordinated effort between friends in Norwood, Telluride, and also um, the offices in Seattle, the Mountain Madness offices in Seattle, as well as officials in China. So it was complicated, it was full of mystery, it was obviously frantic, Mark can speak to it at length, and it was emotional, it was, right before Christmas 2006, so 14 years ago is when this took place. The next picture we've got is the picture of Genyan. This is the mountain that uh, Chris and Charlie were attempting to summit. And um, I love to include this picture as well because it's just a gorgeous picture of, of that peak. So as this process began for me as a writer, the first place I went was research. And I poured over my mom's research. I began reading every book I could that fell into the category of what we would consider mountaineering literature. Now, some of these books, as most of you know, are better than others. Most of them, as you know, are written by men. Most of them are memoirs or memoir-ish, I guess. And so I read book after book until they started to sound kind of the same. And at that point, I realized what I wanted to read didn't exist. So what I wanted as a non-mountaineer was something that could teach me a little bit about the sport, but also had humanity and had depth. And by that point, I had access to Chris's journals and I'd begun to talk to her friends and family. And so I really, understood her spirit. And I wanted to capture that 
but also I wasn't interested in writing just a biography. I wanted to write an adventure story because I was also really fascinated by the details around climbing and the science around training for big expeditions, the complexities of those expeditions. And so I wanted something that could teach and inspire and move and captivate. So basically I wanted to write a book that I would really be interested in reading. And so this was a real turning point for me because at that point I realized what I wanted to write didn't exist and certainly not with a female alpinist at the center of the story. And we've got another picture of Chris. So at this point, this quickly got bigger than I imagined. Uh, I interviewed, I thought I kind of came into this thinking, oh, I'll talk to like 20, 25 people and I'll be good to go. But I ended up talking to maybe 75, 80 people. I read everything I could get my hands on. I traveled to Seattle a couple of times and to Telluride and Norwood. And eventually I went to China to retrace Chris and Charlie's last steps. So as I was researching, and even as I was writing, I was constantly falling down what I describe as rabbit holes as a writer. And I'm finding that readers are having the same experience now with the book, because so much of this world is just so juicy and intriguing, which is why we all read these mountaineering narratives so voraciously. The lifestyles and the personalities, the expeditions, the Sherpa support staff, like all of it, it's really interesting to me. So. I just got sidetracked all the time. And so it's very good to hear that uh, I was able to capture a lot of those different elements and, and readers are having sort of the same experience. Ultimately, I think that I wrote a story that has something for everyone and weaves together a lot of different side stories, but is very grounded in this narrative of this incredibly humble woman and her passion to climb. So now I'm gonna just give you a few intros into people you'll meet in the story. The next image we've got is Keith Boscoff and Keith was Chris's husband. He is the one who got her hooked on the sport of mountaineering uh, when they were both living in Atlanta. Chris had worked for Lockheed as an aerospace engineer and she went to a climbing lecture that Keith was giving and the rest, as we say, is history. And then we've got a couple pictures of Scott Fisher. Scott Fisher and Chris met just one time, they met in 1995, the year before he died on Everest. And so that was really fascinating for me that they had had this interaction and that was a scene uh, and an interaction that I actually was able to recreate with quite a bit of help. So part of the challenge of writing a book like this was that a lot of the main players had passed away and I was adamant that this remain a work of nonfiction. I didn't want it to be historical fiction. So in those instances where I had scenes where everybody had passed, I spent a ton of time talking to people who had heard about interactions that I was writing about uh, newspaper articles, videos, et cetera, et cetera. And then I would put together the scene and then run that past many individuals to make sure that those scenes were as authentic as possible. And it was arduous, but um, made the story very believable as it should be. And then I think we've got maybe one more picture of Scott and I was gonna ask uh, Mark to chime in here because it's it's such a great experience that he's had leading Mountain Madness after taking um, taking the helm from Chris and also having known Scott for the the years that he did. So, I've talked to him about their leadership styles and and what that's like um, having that baton be passed to him. Yeah, yeah, no, it was it was uh, it was interesting uh, uh, process over the years, and I think uh, I, well, I first started guiding in the late eighties and. So I'd guided for several of the bigger companies and someone said, oh yeah, you know, you should go meet Scott and he's down there in West Seattle. And so I thought, oh, you know, what the heck? So I went in there, went into the office and you know, the um, stories about Scott you hear into, in, into thin air and other places or to book about Scott too. But um, you know, he is very charismatic and really good energy. And, and you know, I go in there and uh, there he is, he's doing pull-ups and, you could just really feel uh, the energy and, and, the, and the vibe. It was totally different, and so so I kind of immediately um, felt felt like I that's the place I needed to be. And, and I think the the one thing that really struck me um, was Scott's enthusiasm and, and sort of his passion for climbing. And and you hear a lot about that, and and so you know it it was amazing. I mean, it's like a lot of times you. You hear about people and they maybe don't live up to your expectations but scott certainly did and so 
um, you know, I was there with uh, Scott uh, at the helm for, he, he was there till uh, 96, of course, and I was there for um, two or three years. And and then Chris came along after Scott's death and and it was sort of like, well, you know, what's gonna happen here? And, and I, I really questioned uh, if I wanted to con continue to be there. And I think a lot of people that um, were really had close associations with with Mountain Man is kind of wondering the same thing about you know who, who's this person, Chris, and and she had she had climbed quite a bit and was kind of on her way um, to to the big mountains, but she hadn't really guided a lot, so it it, it kind of raised a lot of questions, and and so um, I kind of stuck it out, and I eventually saw Chris um, was very uh, methodical, and 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 she had a certain way, a little bit different way of looking at at uh, the business and how it was run and and so um it was it was interesting to try to sort of make those, those uh, uh changes but ultimately you know you could see that she shared the same passion for mountains that scott did and so i think as time went on it was it was apparent that that was that was what she was there for her love of mountains and sharing the passion and i think um so i you know i saw that and i you know, just decided to stay the course, and you know, here I am, <laughs> 20, 26 years later, and so um, it's just a really great to be able to hang out and, and work with those two, and, and I think the story uh, Joanna tells about Chris and her her time with that uh, period, uh, at the beginning and to the end, is it's just a great great story. Yeah, we've talked a lot about how most people in the mountaineering world know Scott's name and have heard of Into Thin Air, obviously know his story, but that the real superstar and the real story that you wanted to be told for so many years was Chris's. So it's been great to be able to, to bring that to life. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Great. Okay, I think the next two slides are Charlie Fowler. We've got a young Charlie Fowler right here. This is Charlie ice climbing, I think in the 80s in Colorado. This is actually a picture that was taken by Alex Lowe. And then we've got an older version of Charlie, um, about a year before I think he passed. It's a black and white picture. That next slide, Josh, is kind of an older version of Charlie Fowler. Yeah, there's Charlie. So you'll definitely spend quite a bit of time with Charlie uh, in the book. Uh, he comes in in about chapter 11 of 22, 23 chapters. So he's in the last half of the book. And I know we've got some Charlie friends um, with us tonight. So happy that they are here. The next image is a picture of Chris and her best friend, Jane, who I think is also here tonight. And she's probably mortified that I'm showing this picture. But Jane Courage is happily still with us on this earth and has become a very dear friend of mine. She was incredibly instrumental in helping me understand Chris and her personality and her sense of humor. And we spent many, many hours together talking about um, Chris and her legacy and, and how, how I should kind of approach writing her story. And then we've got an image of Killy Sherpa. Killy Sherpa, this is Killy and Chris. Killy Sherpa was uh, Chris's lead Sherpa in Nepal. He ran the Nepal operations of Mountain Madness and they became very dear friends. Chris and Keith kind of discovered Killy uh, on a trek basically and brought him into Mountain Madness and really helped him become um, a very valued guiding company based uh, out of Kathmandu. So you will also spend quite a bit of time with Killy Sherpa in the story. The next picture we've got is the Genyan Valley. And this is the site, this was the site of Chris and Charlie's last trip. It is just an astonishingly beautiful valley with gorgeous jagged peaks. There are beautiful rushing rivers. This is a monastery, Lungu Monastery, which sits at about 16,000 feet. Uh, obviously very few inhabitants in this entire area. And as I mentioned, I was able to travel there to be able to write those final chapters of the book. That was really important to me to be able to do that in a more authentic way. And it was a, a really a life-changing experience to be there, very magical. And I think more than anything, being over there helped me understand uh, and put into perspective a bit 
uh, what it was that drove Chris and Charlie to seek such unexplored places, which was a kind of a question that I think I went into the book with, uh, and I think a question a lot of us have. So happy to talk about that at the end as well. And then I think we've got one more picture, Josh, and this is a picture of me with a couple of monks at the base of Genyan. Uh, this is just outside that monastery that I mentioned, which sits at the base of the mountain. So the monks were invaluable to me because they, some of them, not all of them, but some of them had actually encountered and talked with Chris and Charlie. Talked is kind of a stretch because neither Chris nor Charlie spoke much Chinese or Tibetan. So speaking is, again, a bit of a stretch. Uh, but I spoke a little Chinese. I do speak a little Chinese and they spoke a little Chinese. So we were able to kind of talk about what that was like when they interacted with Chris and Charlie. And they were really valuable in kind of helping me understand the power of the mountains as well. So I think I mentioned at the beginning that I would kind of circle back to this story about uh, the start of this journey and um, how I kind of came to write the book with my mom. So the backstory as to how this landed in my lap is something I think is worth noting. So Chris and I were both raised in Appleton, Wisconsin. It is a city in Northeast Wisconsin that's about as far away, I like to say, about as far away from the greater Himalayan range as you can possibly be. Chris was three years older than me. And though we went to the same high school and we only lived a couple miles apart, we never met. So we both graduated and we both left, left Appleton, and eventually we both ended up here in Colorado. Chris ended up with Charlie and Telluride, and I ended up here in Denver with my family. And as I said, I wasn't a climber nor a mountaineer, so that's one of the reasons that I didn't know who she was. But the bigger, I think, and more compelling reason is just that she was so darn humble. She had summited more 8,000-meter peaks than any other American woman, which makes her the counterpart to Ed Vister's who is a name that, you know, well-known name in mountaineering circles and beyond, but she was so very under the radar that even being from kind of the same smallish hometown, I didn't know her. So it wasn't until 2006 when Chris and Charlie went missing that there was a little article published in our hometown newspaper. And my mom saw the article and asked if I remembered Chris or if I knew her and I didn't. And mom was intrigued and she began looking into Chris's story and once she understood the depth of Chris's accomplishments, she was convinced that the story needed to be told. So at that point, she reached out to Chris's mom, who lived just a few miles away. And the women forged this really lovely friendship, which exists to this day. And eventually that friendship was passed on to me, along with the boxes of research and the hopes that one day this story would be told. So I'm very happy to say that it has been told now and it's out there in the universe. So I love ending there and i um, happy to take questions. Both Mark and I, I think are looking forward to audience questions. Yeah, thank you so much for that wonderful story that you just told. Um, so yeah, we're now gonna, I'm Shane from Town Hall Seattle. I'm an event manager here. We're gonna turn it over to you if you have any questions you wanna ask Joanna or Mark. Um, if you're in Crowdcast, you can use the ask a question button. If you're on YouTube, you can put it in the chat and we'll bring it over here. Um, just to get things kicked off, uh, Joanna, you had mentioned that you had access to Chris's um, diary. I'm, I'm just wondering how receptive uh, Chris's and Charlie's families were and fr friends about you um, writing the book and how much they participated in it. Yes, I am very grateful because friends and family members were very anxious for the story to be told. Uh, it's such a beautiful, wonderful, inspiring story, a story of resilience. And I think after Chris and Charlie died, there was just deep loss in the mountaineering community. And so there were many people who talked about writing the story, but didn't get around to it. And so when I kind of came forth uh, with the connection that I had being from the same hometown, um, and also, you know, mom had worked on it for 10 years and a few people had talked to her, people were very receptive and welcomed me for the most part with open arms. Um, so very thankful for that. Yeah, thank you. And Mark, I'm wondering if you can talk about how things have changed in the sport since Chris died in regards to women in both participation and in terms of being guides and running guiding companies. Yeah, um, well, it, it's it's getting uh, 
better and better in the sense that um, there's uh, becoming more and more women involved with the sport. Uh, when I first started, I was um, 15, it was late seventies. And, you know, there, there was maybe one in 20 climbers for women. Um, so it's, it's always kind of been, uh, you know, sadly a, a male dominated sport. And, and so um, when, by the time Chris came along, things were definitely improving. There was going to be more uh, women in, in, the, in the sport. And, you know, there weren't necessarily uh, that many women that were being recognized for their accomplishments. And Chris is a perfect example of that. Um, so I think not only with her climbing, was she sort of um, breaking new ground, I think with the, uh, her becoming the owner of Mountain Madness was huge. And I think... Uh, you know, it's 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 something that it still hasn't. Um, there's still a ways to go uh, for for women to take over guide companies, and uh, and I think it's more it's more a matter of the culture. And again, it's like so it's still male dominated, but there's definitely a lot of great things happening. There's an organization in Seattle here, for example. It's it's a, a called She Jumps, and and they mm. they focus on uh, getting women out climbing, and so there's. There's a lot more movement um, to get women out there, both in just, just climbing and also leadership roles as well. So it's, it's, it's getting great. It's getting a lot better. And, and I think Chris had a um, good, uh, important story to tell and, and had a role in that for sure. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. And Joanna, you kind of mentioned this a little bit, but did you find it challenging to write the story not being a mountaineer or a climber yourself? That's interesting. So I came into the project thinking that that was going to be a big problem because I had so much to learn and I felt like, ooh, they might not want to talk to me because I'm not kind of part of the club. Mm -hmm. And I actually found it quite helpful uh, because of that exact reason. So I came to the table with so much to learn and people like to talk. So, and I like to listen. So I was happy to spend hours and hours on the phone just kind of asking question after quest question. And I think people really enjoyed the process of sort of educating me and teaching me and telling their stories. Uh, so in the end, it was beneficial, I think, thankfully. Yeah. OK, so we have a question here from Emily. Um, Emily um, asks, would you speak a little bit more about Chris's friendship with Kili Sherpa? I'm a longtime friend of Kili's, and he has said that he owes his career and successful business to Chris. It seems like it was a powerful friendship. Yeah, Mark, do you want to take that one? Or should I? Either one of us, I think, could answer that. Well, I, I could only say that it was a very powerful friendship. And, and I think, uh, uh, Joanna, you tell, tell the story great in terms of how they met. And and I, you know, I, I was able to get over there to Nepal and, and, and be with Keeley quite a bit. And, and you know, you, he just thought the world of Chris. And, and it's true, he he um, worked with Chris and, and the success of his business, they worked together and, and to combine their efforts, they, they went so far. And, and I think um, Keeley's will forever be grateful for those opportunities. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, Joanna, like I said, she tells the story so, so great in the book about their, yeah, meet, their meeting. There's a lot of Killy in the book and they I like to think that they sort of grew up in the industry together. They sort of learned the ropes together yeah. uh, and became very close friends despite this kind of difference in gender and culture and basically everything. So I was able to spend quite a bit of time with Killy um, when I was researching and he has this little shrine to Chris in his yeah. home and will be forever grateful for her in his life, yeah. sure. And does he, to this day, um, is he still, you know, operating the the climbing experiences over in Nepal and and whatnot? You answered that one, Mark. I think. Yeah, no, he he, you know, he's uh, been in the business. I mean, he started. God, I, I forget was he um, is a porter or mm -hmm. he, yeah. so he started literally from the ground up, and 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 with Chris's help and the business Mount Manus brought and. Uh, the growth that they experienced together with getting more people working with Keeley, um, you know, he, he kind of rose to the ranks. I mean, he was um, one of the uh, most widely recognized uh, tour operators in, in Nepal. And so, yeah, it's, it's, it's like uh, Jonah said, they kind of grew, grew into that 
both of them uh, into the positions that they did in the fall. And, and they were both widely recognized. And so, yeah, an amazing relationship. For and sure. he's still in the business. He works yes. for a lot of different guiding companies, not yeah. just Mountain Madness. So. Gotcha. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, this next question comes from Lori, and um, it has a few parts to it. So um, I'll, I'll ask all of it, and then we can kind of revisit. Okay. But um, she asks, Joanna, how do you think the book would have been different had your mother completed it? Um, did you continue with what she'd written, or did you start over to make it your own? If your mom was able to, or if your mom was able, did she play a part in your writing, and was she satisfied with the outcome? Multi-part questions. Oh, I love them. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, I'll kind of take this apart. So my mother researched tons and tons of research. She didn't actually start writing the book. She worked on the book by way of research and calls and conversations, but she hadn't actually started writing. Her vision was for more of a kind of straight up typical biography, as I mentioned. And I was interested in something much more because there were so many other characters and I call them characters, even though they were real people that I wanted to kind of integrate into the story. I wanted a lot of Scott Fisher. I wanted to cover Scott Fisher in a way that he hadn't been covered in Into Thin Air or the movie Everest. And I think I did that. I wanted Killy in there. I wanted the women in Chris's life in there as well and her relationship with Keith and Charlie. So it was much bigger, I think, than it would have been had my mom written it because it wouldn't have been just a strict biography. So she was able to help me along the way with editing and whatnot. And I would send her small sections and she could help me um, a little bit with that. And she was, she's still with us and she was able to read the book when it was published and she's happy with the outcome, of course. Would she say anything different? She said no. <laughs> <laughs> Great, well, thank you for that. Um, this next question comes from Joan, who's um, submitted this on YouTube. Joan asks, both Chris and Joanna transferred from their original professional profession training to a whole different fields, climbing and writing. What led to these switches um, in their life direction? Oh, that's such a great question. So by the end of working on this book, I definitely felt sort of a sisterhood with or a kinship. I don't know what the word would be exactly, but I felt simpatico with Chris because our lives sort of were on these parallel paths, even though we didn't know each other. And that's kind of the beauty and how this ended up on my lap. Um, we, I think, ultimately just ended up following our passions and we kind of headed down one direction that was maybe very typically Midwestern 1980s. Here's what you're going to do. And it's going to look just like this. And then somewhere along the way, as happens with all of us, I think, we had a little bit of a light bulb and realized, actually, I want to kind of do a U-turn here and go in a slightly different direction. And so she did that. And I definitely have done that not once, but a number of times in my career. And so, um, yeah, I love that part of the story. Thank you for that. Uh, this next question comes from Cindy. And Cindy asks, was there anyone else killed in the avalanche? Did they have guides with them? Oh my gosh, Mark, I think that's a spoiler, isn't it? I don't think yeah, I can answer that question. <laughs> Is well, that we can say that they didn't have guides with them because yes. they were guides. Yes. So they, no, right. they were out there on their own and what happened, you got to read the book. Yes, that's but, good. Uh, that's fair. Yes, they were so off the grid that they definitely didn't have guides because they didn't <laughs> need guides. They were guides. Um, so, but, but to that point, I think, I think that what I was trying to say earlier about Chris changing her focus from 8,000 meter peaks to going to a place like Ganyan. I and mean, that was, that was a very conscious and deliberate choice. And I think um, this seeing her uh, go through that process was, was wonderful. And I think uh, uh, so, so yeah, they were in a place that they wanted to be and there was not a lot of other people around us to see that, that, that. <laughs> find out the rest. Yeah. And when so I in there, the when I, was oh, sorry, go ahead. When, I was, when I was there doing research, uh, this was in 2018, um, I was kind of climbing. I climbed up to this, the place on the mountain where they had been, and I was with a guide who's also a character in the book, and he at one point said, this path that we're walking on, 
nobody has probably walked on this path since Chris and Charlie and the rescue team. So very, very remote, yes, very off the grid. And I was actually about to ask, was this one a, a case of, um, you know, sort of being there for the first time, nobody else had, uh, someone did this particular peak and Good question. So yes and no. This particular mountain uh, is a sacred mountain. So climbing it in the first place was a little bit of controversy. So there is controversy in the way that this happened at the end. They didn't get climbing permits. They didn't leave lots of details about where they were going. And um, it was a sacred mountain. So it had been summited, I believe, two other times. Uh, so it it wasn't an unsummited peak, but I think that they were trying a different line, if I'm not mistaken. Is that your recollection, Mark? Yeah, no, they're they're looking. I mean, they they basically were on this trip together to do new routes and climb peaks that hadn't been climbed. And, and again, that that was becoming an appeal for Chris, and it's already sort of, sort of something Charlie was uh, really focused on. But uh, yeah, I I think they were doing a new route. Right. Yeah. Right. And I don't know if, if uh, this might lead to some spoilers, so maybe you don't want to talk too much yeah. about this, but could you elaborate a little bit more on the, the rescue effort? Sure. Let's see. <laughs> say that, that could be a spoiler. Um, oh, gosh, Mark, should I put you on the spot for that? I don't know. That's a tough one. I'm um, trying to think, like, what specifically we could share. Well, I, I mean, to me, the, the, the story... I mean, everyone knows about Into Thin Air, right? And so Into Thin Air was a very sort of compact story uh, took took place on Mount Everest, right? And so um, you'd, all the players were, you know, known. And and I, I think the um, Chris and Charlie's story in Search and Rescue is totally different. And I think um, that's almost enough to, enough to, to say it. I mean, it was yeah. take, took place in China. People didn't know where they were. Yeah, and I leave it at that, and it's 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 a every bit as intriguing story. In some ways, um, much more interesting. Just it was just so much more difficult to follow. Right, we've talked a lot about that. Actually, I love that comparison. That Scott's disappearance and rescue and recovery was every step of it was in the media, and he was documenting at every point in that expedition what he was doing, and it was a big commercial, you know, brouhaha. And Chris and Charlie purposely went under the radar. So in order to launch that search and rescue effort, it, effort, it was, it just took a whole nother, um, it went to a whole nother dimension. Yeah. Uh, so that, this next question comes from Lori and Lori is asking, this is a question for Mark. Uh, what do you think Chris's motivation was in buying Mountain Madness? If she hadn't done much guiding herself prior to that, was it partially so that she could burn herself? Huh. I'll, I'll take that one. I, I think, um, well, both she and Keith, uh, they climbed together and, and did, did quite a bit together in the mountains. And, and I think uh, uh, the next logical step for them, because they both love climbing so much, um, was to maybe see if they could make it uh, you know, part of their lifestyle, and, and I think, you know, I think that was that's another thing that I really liked both about um, Scott and Chris is that they recognized owning a guiding business was about owning a lifestyle job, and and, and it's like nobody retires early in that business. And so, so I think um, I, I think the motivation for Scott and Chris both also was that um, owning a guiding company is it's a vehicle to uh, other places really uh, and in, in both their instances that you know they traveled the world and, and saw amazing things climbed amazing things and so yeah it was kind of a logical um progression for for both uh chris and, and keith so yeah and maybe uh, for you too yeah <laughs> right yeah well that, i guess i guess yeah all that all that kind of holds true for me as well i mean it's a lifestyle job still and I'm, I'm gonna be working for another decade probably so but but <laughs> You know, afforded me all these uh, amazing adventures and meeting incredible people like Chris and Scott and all the people we work with. And yeah, so it's it, it was something that they, they were motivated to do and they and they bought a great company. Yeah. So Thank yeah, you for that. Another part of the question about her guiding. Yeah. So I think 
yeah, I think she, you know, she's a very, uh, very technical oriented person with her engineering background and that sort of thing. And so she really took to the technical aspects of climbing. And, and so I think um, the guiding part, you know, along with the just being out of mountains, there's a lot of technical uh, part, parts of it too. And I think it was this really good opportunity for uh, her to become a guide and also really improved her climbing as well, that whole process. Yeah. This next question comes from Heidi. And Heidi um, asks, when writing about Chris and Charlie, what sources did you use to really bring uh, their personalities to life? Great question. So as I mentioned, at some point, I think I had access to Chris's journals. So that was definitely a big source of inspiration for me to be able to read those deep feelings that she had um, as they were falling in love and as they were climbing and as they were traveling. So that I think really brings her to life in the story in a really unique way. And some of those journal excerpts are included in the book. Uh, and then in terms of Charlie, lots and lots of time talking to dear friends in Telluride uh, and in Seattle to a certain extent, but most of Charlie's dearest friends um, are still in Telluride. So lots of Telluride conversations and many, many hours talking to Ginny Fowler uh, Hicks, who was uh, Charlie's sister. So lots of time talking to his sister as well. All right, thank you for that. And just to add sort of a segue from there, um, did either Chris or Charlie have have kids or other extended family? No kids, neither of them had kids. Um, extended family, well, Charlie I mentioned had a sister. It was Charlie and Ginny and his mother um, died after he did. Chris had three older brothers, so and who are all still with us. Um, so, and I've made contact with all three of them, and um, they're happy that their sister's legacy is finally being uh, recognized. Thank you. Uh, we have another question here from Joan on YouTube. She asks, "How do mountaineers assess the wisdom of Chris and her partner's adventure?" How about the two of you? What would you tell your own kids who might want to follow Chris and her partner's lifestyle choices? Okay, tag your head on that one, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> you go first. Yeah, well, so the first part is you have, um, uh, well, I guess the question about assessing the wisdom of uh, their adventure, I think, um, you know, I guess there's always the big question if you're a climber and you have family that's irresponsible to go out there. And, and so that that's a whole big conversation right there. But I think in terms of, of, of Chris and Charlie, I mean, they, they knew the risks. And, and so um, whether or not, um, you know, when you cross that line and you end up uh, getting taken down by an avalanche or whatever the case is, you know, I guess, you know, that your, your time's up. And then I think, um, that's part of the, the risk of climbing. And I, and I think um, <laughs> whether it's wise to take take on those risks, I mean, that's a whole other conversation as well. So I you know, can't really um, judge what other people do. It's it's whether, you know, whether or how they impact other people that maybe is, is the bigger question, which is your second question. And <laughs> I think um, – I mean, I think it goes back to, to passion and if, if my kid's passion was to climb or do some other sort of risky endeavor, I would, I would, I would tell them to go for it. But, you know, I think you have to be smart about these things and especially when there's um, activities that involve life or death. And so um, it's just making smart choice choices and, and, and learning, learning the, the sport and, and all the technical aspects and, everything to sort of keep it safe and so it's i don't think it's irresponsible it's just you got to educate yourself and from a writing point of view this was very difficult for me as a writer because i'd spent so much time with chris and charlie in the research and the writing up until the point where they pass away in the avalanche that when we get to that point where you see them kind of making these decisions that may or may not be questionable as a writer, I just kind of was constantly screaming, ooh, are you sure about this? And are you sure about that? And 
So it was difficult for me because I had grown so attached to them. So I worked very hard not to make judgments as a writer in the book, because I think we all kind of come at life decisions from different points of view. Um, I will say in my own life now, I am the mom to a 17 year old. I will call him a wannabe aspiring climber who doesn't want to take any lessons. Mm -hmm. and just kind of wants to go out there and like kind of learn by himself. Yeah. And I'm, I'm not really into that. <laughs> and so unfortunately he has a mother who's written a mountaineering narrative. So um, I basically like make him carry an avalanche beacon even when he goes to high school. So that's fun. <laughs> <laughs> So we have a question here. Um, what did you discover about the notion of trying to climb a sacred peak? How did they acknowledge or feel about that? Well, that was a fascinating area for me to dive into. And that was one of those areas that I spent a lot of time researching and I could write a whole book on that. That was one of those rabbit holes that I mentioned earlier. So. I learned that whether or not sacred peaks are climbed is a matter of personal preference and everybody kind of has a different way of approaching this. And some climbers won't go near a sacred peak. Some climbers don't think twice about it and go to the top and never crosses their mind. Many mountaineers will climb a sacred peak but won't get to the very top. They'll stop short of summiting uh, on deck on, you know, out of deference for the mountain. And so everybody kind of comes at it a little different, which I always thought was very interesting. We will never know. That's one of those unknown questions. Um, what Chris and Charlie were actually planning to do if they were planning to stop short of the summit or get to the tip top. Um, so that's one of those mysteries from the book that will remain unanswered. Mm -hmm. Mark, do you have anything to add to this one? This is a great question. No, I, I mean, you're right. It's, it's, a, it's a big question. And uh, and you can go dive pretty deep in it. For me, I think the the thing that um, that, that's impacted me, and I've seen it happen, is is when people break the rules uh, or climb a sacred peak. It often has impacts on not only the local people and their traditions and their culture, but like for for example, we um, worked with some uh, Kogi Indian tribe in in Colombia for years to try to get permission. And, and have their blessing to go into this area. We, we got the permission, went in there, and then shortly thereafter, some people went in without permission, and the Kogi people said, nope, nobody's going back in there. And so I think it's, it's, uh, it's a, in my opinion, it's, it's, you have to look outside yourself when you answer, answer uh, that question. And whether or not Charlie did or how they answer it, that's, that's their um, decision, but that's that's kind of my my thoughts about it, and it, it, it has impacts for lots of different people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you for that. So this is going to be our last question for the evening. Um, and so, Mark, this is for you. Given that you know the year that we've had this year, um, and adventure travel has taken a hit in 2020, what's the outlook for Mountain Madness and other adventure okay. companies in 2021? And sort of what's for both of you what's sort of your outlook for the next year or up, upcoming years um as far as mountaineering and, and adventures go yeah well for mountain madness i mean i think we're gonna we're gonna sweep by um you know we've been in business since 1984 um so uh you know we've seen all sorts of crazy things happen. We've lost two company owners. We went through 9-11, we went through the Great Recession, and now we have uh, this pandemic. And I think this has certainly been the most challenging, uh, not only for Mount, Mount Madness, but the travel industry as a whole. And so I think uh, you know it's gonna be interesting to see who survives and who maybe rises from the dead and sort of reinvents themselves. And um, But I'm, I'm happy to report, I think they're gonna make it. <laughs> thanks, thanks for that question. Yeah. Joanna, anything that you wanted to add? Let's see, adventures ahead. Um, I'll take a trip with Mountain Madness at some point. <laughs> Count on that, Mark. Uh, and I'm spending the next few weeks just kind of continuing to get this story out into the universe. I have been so happy to connect with lots of book clubs all across the country. It's just a really lovely, magnificent book to read um, for, for your book club. So if you have book club members out there, um, please consider reading it. And then I'm one of these authors who's really able to chat with you virtually at the end of your read. 
So that's been good and that'll continue into 2021. And I hope to find another adventure story out there in the universe to work on next. I think I've got another book in me. <laughs> Well, I want to thank both you and Mark for being with us this evening and for everybody else for tuning in. Uh, Town Hall Seattle is going to be taking a, a winter break over the next couple of weeks. However, if you enjoyed this event, you can find past events on our website along with upcoming ones in January and beyond at townhallseattle.org. We hope you'll consider making a donation as your support will allow us to continue to provide events just like this one. If you're interested in purchasing a copy of Joanna's book, Edge of the Map, The Mountain Life of Christine Boxoff, please use the link on this live stream page to purchase through our friends at Elliott Bay Book Company. And we hope you will check out both the Mountain Madness website and Joanna's website, which I will link here in the chat in a moment so you can see more information about their work. And finally, thank you again for being here. Have, um, happy holidays, 